Hi, we're back with another investigative video. Today we're going to talk about the story of the Angarsk maniac. You might have heard about Mikhail Popkov, who is considered to be the most notorious killer in modern Russia. About 80 people became his victims. All of them were murdered in Angarsk in Irkutsk Oblast, or nearby. Sasha Sulim, a journalist, has been doing research on this for a long time. She's written many articles about it. Her book about catching serial killers in Russia is coming out soon. During her trip to Angarsk, she managed to see Popkov himself. He was transferred from Mardovia prison to Irkutsk detention center because he remembered about two more murders. What's also important is that Sasha managed to reconstruct the timeline of Popkov's case and arrest. She talked to these great policemen who caught him. For me, this story is fascinating because people who were against the system succeeded. What happened to these policemen is indeed revealing. Could you tell me what time it is now? What time? It's 9.20. Thank God. Why? I have a curfew at 10. I will have some time to smoke when I go back. It's been less than a year since he was sent to prison, and now he's back at the detention center. Do you think it was his initial plan? Or has he indeed forgotten and it came back to him? I think he had this plan. Probably he planned it for about two years in advance. He once said, I need to go there to see how people live in a different world. And here we are. Are you allowed to talk about it in more detail? While the investigation is in progress, I can't disclose all the details. The crimes were committed between 1995 and 1998. That was the time when he began to commit crimes. We're passing by one of the murder sites on the right. A woman joined a party of policemen. They were having fun, drinking alcohol. One of them tried to sexually harass her. They had an argument, and she went back home early in the morning. At that time, Popkov was cycling nearby. He saw a drunk, sad woman. He asked her to tell him what had happened. She said she was almost raped. He asked her why she was spending time with him and how she didn't expect to be raped there. They started arguing about this. Popkov took out his little knife that he had carried with him and stabbed her in the neck and chest. Popkov committed most of his crimes on this road. He murdered and raped women here. Can you tell me the approximate number of victims? About 30 to 40 of them. They were murdered here. In the 2000s, when we were still looking for him, this road had exit roads every 500 meters, which was very handy for Popkov. He wasn't fussy about the place. He just went off the road to commit a crime.
There's a lake just outside the town. We went there to swim for about one, one and a half hours, and we came back. My friend's wife was waiting for him. He drove us back and left the car in the garage. Then you and Natalia went to see someone else. Yeah, we went to our friend who lived nearby to go on with the party. Right. I see. Did you drink alcohol? Only one bottle of dry wine for the three of us. That's all. Then you fell asleep? Yes. I had just come back from a 24-hour shift. Titova and her husband's friend had sexual intercourse. Then she went out to buy something, cigarettes or something else. At that moment, Popkov approached her and offered to continue the party together. She agreed. I woke up early in the morning, but she wasn't there. I went to see her friends, she wasn't there either. She was found more than a day later. Popkov crossed the road, turned left to the railway. He took her out of the car and killed her with a screwdriver. The prosecutor wanted to see me twice a year on a regular basis. He wanted me to come up with more testimony. We saw other women disappearing in a similar way. Mm -hmm. The prosecutor asked me to comment on that, too. He was asking about my assumptions. That friend you stayed with that night, he was also a suspect? Yes. He was sent to a detention center for two or three days. Why? He saw her leaving, mm -hmm. but later he was released. Her husband, Dmitry, still doesn't believe that she was cheating on him. Well, his friends said they had sexual intercourse. As far as I understand, his DNA was found on the body. That's right. According to this test, Popkov did not rape her. We know that there was sexual intercourse between the two because Popkov told us about it. Natalia told Popkov that they all consumed alcohol. The husband was too drunk, so she didn't mind doing it with her husband's friend. Then she went out and accepted Popkov's invitation to his car. She wanted more love. Well, she got what she wanted. Angarsk is 40 kilometers away from Irkutsk. It was founded after World War II. Soviet magazines declared that it was the ex-military that built the city. In reality, it was built by labor camp prisoners that were sent here from different corners of the USSR. After leaving the camps, ex-prisoners settled in the town. Therefore, the prisoners' culture became a part of the city's life. In the 1990s, in the town with a population of 2,000 people, there were a dozen criminal gangs. You could witness criminal wars on the streets. Hundreds of citizens were victims. Women and young girls were among them. Possibly that's why the police didn't notice the serial killer. In the early 1990s, corpses of women were regularly found in the suburbs of Angarsk, their bodies showing signs of violence. Before 1995, no one really knew these cases were related. They were seen as different crimes. But then, 1998 saw the peak of murders. They found a woman's corpse once or even twice a month. Sometimes, two women who knew each other were found dead. 
How did your investigation group come together in 2002? There was an article titled Wednesday Killer by a writer named Mark Deitch. He described what was happening in Ungarsk. He also attached photos of the murder victims. After that, the General Prosecutor's Office and the Ministry of Internal Affairs began their investigation. They sent an investigator from Moscow named Valery Kostyrev. He had experience with serial killers before. He's a real professional. The Ministry of Internal Affairs sent Sergei Dirjavin to help. He was a lieutenant colonel then. So they arrived, they looked at all similar cases in the region, even outside Angarsk. They looked at Usolia and Irkutsk. Then they chose about 30 criminal cases where the victims were women. The way the crimes were committed, the places, the types of injuries were all very similar. These cases were unified into one block. Kostyrev and Dirjavin were leaders of the newly formed investigation group. The prosecutor's office sent us the best people. While the police sent us random people. Why did they do that? Why did they send these random people? Nobody believed it was really a serial killer. Even if it was so, they didn't believe there could be success after so many years. Moreover, no one wanted to give their brightest policemen because they had other regular work to do, other crimes to solve. I had just graduated from the MIA Academy. I was 19. It was only two months and 20 days after my graduation. It was an accident that I met my chief in the corridor and he sent me to Angarsk. I wondered why they were sending me there that soon. He said I was the best person to go. He came here by car. You could turn your car around if needed. He came here so no one could see him from the road. He stopped the car here and then killed Oksana Straganova. Where are you? Here, the youngest. And your mom? Here she is, holding me. It was in 1997. My birthday is on the 11th of September, so I remember she disappeared a few days later. She left to work and was out all day. My brother and I went to see our grandmother. Our mom was away, so we went to get some food, since neither of us could cook. Before she was killed, Oksana Straganova was consuming alcohol with her friend and someone else she knew. Late at night, she decided to carry on with the party. Although both of her underage sons were home at the time. She hitchhiked and ended up in Popkov's car. She agreed to have more drinks with him. He took her here to kill her. Our grandmother was very emotional. I think she immediately rushed to look for her. She probably went to ask friends or talk to the police. My mother also had friends in the police, so maybe it was helpful. I think she went with Popkov because he said he was a policeman. And she ended up here. All her policeman friends were checked, including polygraph and semen analysis. 
проводили генетические экспертизы, но не совсем. Маленьким не говорили ничего. Я... We were children and we were told nothing. Our mom went missing and then we attended her funeral. We didn't know what happened in between. Of course, we weren't told that she was killed and raped. We tried to talk to relatives of other victims. Hi, I'm a Moscow journalist. My name is Sasha. I chatted with Natalia earlier. She doesn't want to talk to you. We arranged the meeting. We came all the way from Moscow. It's not going to take long. Okay. We'll come back in an hour, okay? Honestly, it won't take long. We tried to see more than 10 victims. By victims, I mean relatives of the women killed by Popkov. The relatives cannot come back to the horrible memories. Also, over the past year, they had to repeat their stories many times. However, one of his so-called surviving victims, Evgenia, agreed to talk to us without a camera. He showed me his police ID card. He seemed friendly and offered to give me a lift. I hesitated, but he convinced me that he was not going to harm me. Obviously, I believed him. She drank alcohol with her friends. There were two guys and two girls. She decided to go back home late at night. She went out to get a car. Her friends went out to see her off. They remembered she got into a black car. Popkov had a Honda Civic at the time. It was a dark color, it was black. She got into his car. She said she lost consciousness on the way. Maybe she was too drunk. Or maybe she fell asleep. I remember I was terrified as we arrived at the forest. I realized that something wasn't right. I was wearing high-heeled shoes. So I took them off and I ran away. He hit me on the head. I don't even know what it was. Maybe he was banging my head against a tree. He was beating me and strangling me. She came to her senses somewhere in the forest. She was completely naked. At that time, there was a road here. So he left her completely naked here. She was found by some people who were picking mushrooms. They called an ambulance, which arrived and took her to the hospital. She spent a long time in the emergency department due to severe head injuries. Now she's doing fine. She's married with two children. Another surviving victim is Svetlana Nisyevichova, who was attacked in 1998. Popkov thought she was dead, but she woke up in the mortuary. The interesting thing about both Evgenia and Svetlana is that they could have provided crucial evidence at that time. They knew his name because he introduced himself as Mikhail. He had shown them his ID card, and one of them was even driven in the police car. Why did this evidence not help to catch him then? That was the attitude of the prosecutors and the policemen at the time. 
То есть, если бы они бы более бы тщательно бы все ну, проверяли. If they had researched it properly and treated their testimony seriously. Травмы головы, он там не соображает, что говорит. Отношение было такое. It would have all been different. Действительно. Не верили некоторым словам. They did not believe the testimony of the victims, as sometimes they were confused due to the serious injuries they received. Ну и вот, и как бы вот с этим вот УАЗиком... Although there were not too many police ВАЗ cars in Ангарск, they checked only one car and forgot about it. Like that testimony was not proved. Значит, все это, ну, она придумала, да? So they implied she made it up. Понимаю, что на, на тот период, 98 год, in 1998, the police did not want its officers to be convicted for a rape and a murder or an attempted murder. If they had checked all cars, Popkov would have been found then. What is that building? That was the headquarters of the operative group that investigated the serial murder cases of the women. You mean the investigation staff? Yes. You came here in 2005? Yes, in May 2005. I was a senior operative of the criminal investigation department of Irkutsk region. When they came, their aim was to find violations on the part of the leadership of the main directorate of internal affairs for Irkutsk region. Angarsk prosecutor's office. That's what we thought, because we were feeling guilty and we thought we might be punished for that. It's what our superiors were thinking, since it became clear the serial killer really existed. But they had failed to find him. They expected to see sanctions introduced. Meaning some of the bosses might have been fired. A few high-ranking bosses of the criminal police department were very good at their jobs. They really were good. They even asked me in private conversations whether I believed that the serial killer existed. Ну вот скажи честно, ну вот ты веришь, что есть маньяк или нет? They wanted to know why this investigation group was created. Вообще группа, то есть у них весь опыт их работы, там десять. Some of them had ten to thirty years of experience. Не не включал в себя такого преступления. But they had never come across crimes of this kind. Я приду на косячу здесь. Nobody who had been sent here wanted to do their job well. They wanted to be sent back to their usual workplace. The thing is that they saw no immediate result of their work. Every day the police solve crimes. So you feel involved. With Popkov, you had to be patient. You had to do a lot of monotonous work without any action like chases and shootings or whatever else you might think is romantic in our profession. In our case, you had to think more than act. Morozov had a thorough look at each case. The first thing he did is he gathered all of the operatives together and asked us what each of us thought. He wrote down everything we said. We did some brainstorming. Each of us expressed our opinion. Ideas that overlapped helped to make a plan. For example, we discussed what we thought of the killer, how he chose the location for the crime, why he undressed the women, why he raped some of them but did not rape others. Later, we answered all of the questions. At first, the most important thing, and this is an objective fact, is that the DNA found in three of the victims matched. 
ДНК, который нашли. You mean the DNA of the sperm found in the victims' bodies matched? Так было сделано. Yes. Это один и тот же человек. So you concluded that they were raped by the same person? Ну как бы ничего не сделаешь. It was the main evidence that we found. Это то, что убийства были не мотивированными, не бытовыми. Secondly, these murders were not the result of a conflict or a party. Это были все женщины, причем женщины. Moreover, all of them were females with a similar body type. Практически одного и того же телосложения. Это были крупные женщины. They were all voluptuous. С мужскими формами. Вот. Следующее. All of them were drunk to an extent and therefore having lost control over the situation. Could get into a stranger's car. We discovered that by that time he either was or had been a policeman or he had worked in the prosecutor's office. How did you know this? The thing is, 90% of the victims were found in the suburbs of Angarsk. In the 1990s, in order to leave the city with a woman in your car and come back without a security check, you had to know how to bypass the checkpoints. These checkpoints were located on the way out from the city. At night, every car was stopped and checked. There were not many cars because not many people could afford them. They wrote down the personal information of anyone who went in and went out. Popkov's information was not in any of the databases. He worked in the police, so he was allowed to come and go without a check. They knew he worked in the emergency police center. Maybe he showed his policeman ID, so he would be let in and out. Basically, if we have the DNA of the criminal, we can compare it to the DNA of all suspects. Why was that hard to perform? When I started in 2005, they couldn't do any more than 10 DNA tests. Ten tests a year? Yes. They sent only the DNA of the most matching suspects to Moscow. Why only 10? Was it too expensive? Yes, it was too costly back then. Also, they could only do it in Moscow. It cost a few thousand dollars, which was equal to an annual income for one of us. As time passed, technologies developed. At some point, when Andrei Chernus from Novosibirsk became head of the investigation group, he asked me to meet with him so he could tell me about a new technology for DNA testing. It used Russian equipment, which made the procedure a lot cheaper. Was it because of this technology that you advanced with the investigation? It didn't simply advance the investigation. It was actually the most decisive factor. I don't know how long it would have taken to make Popkov's DNA test if we had carried on making only 10 tests per year. Stunning views, right? Yes, incredible. Popkov killed one of the women and threw the corpse down there. Not many people go there because the place is hard to reach. The body was accidentally found by some fishermen. Popkov used to come here with his family. He came here in summer and winter. These are pictures in his photo album that prove that he used to come here. The pictures were taken here. This is him making barbecue, hugging his wife. He took his daughter here for skiing. And at some point, 
He killed a woman here and threw her corpse off the precipice. He knew the second woman he killed here. He took her clothes off and buried her there, a meter and a half below the surface. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm not a sailor. I prefer to be on the land. She was a senior cashier at a shop. At that time, there was such a position. Was it a well-paid position? Yes. Her New Year's bonus was one million rubles. Well, I only received 300,000. So she was the breadwinner. Yeah. Лижная and Пашковская worked in a supermarket. One of them was a manager. The other was a cashier. They were friends. One day they got together after work and decided to party. They drank alcohol. Then they had to get back to their homes. But you couldn't get a taxi at that time. So people had to hitchhike. When I got home, the door was locked. I rang the bell, but no one came. Then our neighbor, Nelia, came out said my wife was missing and people were looking for her. We went to the police to report it. What did the police say? Did they try to convince you she would be back? Yes, that's what they usually say. They told me she went to see her boyfriend. But I knew her. I knew she wouldn't do that. She had children and family. She couldn't just leave. Popkov's car was stopped at one of the central streets. The women who stopped his car were a bit tipsy. He suggested that they continue the party together. They agreed. And he headed to Irkutsk, along the highway. Then Popkov drove off the road, turned into the forest, found a place where he couldn't be seen from the road, and stopped the car. Popkov thought that they were fallen women, because they had agreed to go with him. Therefore, he had to kill them. He pulled one of them aside while the other one was waiting. He pretended he was choosing between the two, flirting with one of them more. He killed the first one, then came back to the car to kill the other one, and then took her body to the same place. I think he killed the second woman, because she had witnessed the death of her friend. My brother and I were looking for her for a few days. We had no trust in the police. I hoped we could find her ourselves, but we didn't find her. Our neighbor knew someone in the police. They reported a dead woman in Irkutsk Oblast. And the woman had one of her toes. It wasn't broken, it was twisted. And that's how we found her. When he got home, he realized that he had left his policeman's badge at this place. He was a retired policeman by then, but he hadn't handed in his badge. It was attached to his key ring. The next day, he came back here. As he says, he saw one of the two victims standing on her knees, trying to speak. She was regaining her consciousness. He returned to the car, picked up a shovel, and killed her. We couldn't figure out why the experts were saying that the time of death was different. According to the experts, they were both killed here, but their deaths occurred at different times. 
предполагали, что где-то их там и удерживали. We assumed the victims were probably kept somewhere for a while. We went to nearby towns and villages to search, but it turned out to be more banal than we had expected. Что просто он ее не добил, если бы он не потерял бы. If he hadn't forgotten his badge, she might have survived and provided testimony against Popkov. How do you usually explain why the Angarsk maniac managed to evade punishment for so long? What is the city of Angarsk? What is it like? It's a town where two murders took place on a daily basis between 1990 and 2008. I mean, it was at least two crimes a day, including both criminal and domestic murders. There were some organized pitch battles and people killed each other in those. There were regular shootings. People who investigated the crimes had to spend a lot of time working on them. They simply couldn't find time to look for the killer. Mikhail Popkov knew that there were too many crimes to investigate right here, right now. First of all, he knew how we work and how we search. Secondly, no one could arrest him. Even if he had had bloodstains on his clothes, or even with a body in his car, everyone knew each other in Ungarsk. Also, he was an assistant duty officer, so people knew him well. He was not suspected, not because of his high position. Simply, no one could believe that this person, the policeman that you know so well, could commit a crime. Therefore, he could easily go anywhere without being suspected. He deliberately spread fake information. He went to some of the murder places with other policemen. It was he who received the calls reporting the murders. When he realized that he could be found out, he began to take measures, but he couldn't stop the killing. It was his adrenaline rush. He needed to rape, to satisfy his sexual needs, to kill, and at the same time, he enjoyed not being caught. He mocked the system. He positioned himself above it. And he was successful for a while. By 2002, when professionals from Moscow joined the investigation, he was retired, but his wife still worked in the passport office. After 2002, the number of crimes he committed decreased significantly. Before that, he used to kill two or three people a month. He couldn't control himself. But this investigative group served as a barrier for him. It was documented that some evidence had been taken from the murder scene. When I asked where they were, Kostyarev and Dirjavin said that almost 90% of these objects were missing. And we only had a few of them to rely on. Our starting point was not even zero. It was below zero. That's why it took us so long. Rooms with the evidence were flooded. Heating pipes had broken. Some objects were simply lost. At least 20% of the evidence that could have been used against Popkov was lost. His DNA traces were on those objects. Why do you think it took so long to find you? That's easy to explain. As soon as the technology is developed, they caught me. They were able to do multiple DNA checks. It was like an airstrike. Many people could be killed at once. I was one of the many whose DNA was checked. At 5 a.m., Popkov came to the station to buy some pies during his shift. On the way to the store, 
he saw Dorogova. He stopped to ask where she was heading. She said she was on the way to the train station to meet her mother. Popkov was in uniform. He drove in here. He forced her to have sex. She was sober. She didn't give any consent. He basically raped her. The railway station is only 500 meters away. He killed her here. Artyom is the kind of person who could catch a criminal by his little toe and then work his way up to his throat and catch the rest of the body. He was very persistent in achieving his aims. He was the exact person we needed to find the killer. At the end of 2009, Yuri Morozov was promoted. And although the bosses really didn't like it, he appointed me to replace him. This place looks gorgeous from a boat. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it does. In the summer, we rafted along this river twice. With your children? No, with my ex-colleagues. I see, out with the guys. Yes. In 2012, after the New Year holidays, we came together to discuss the case again. We thought that if we didn't solve the crime by the end of the year, we would be dismissed. So we had another brainstorming session to get a better idea of the killer. We knew he drove a Neva. His blood type was B, and that he worked in the police. Our objective was to look at all matching men of his age. Those who had at least two matches were to be checked first. At first, we had a list of almost 3,000 people. Around 340 of them had more than one match, including Popkov. We started checking people in alphabetical order. So, we only found him in April 2012, when we reached the letter P. In June, I got a call from Domorodov, who told me they had a suspect. They checked the DNA of Mikhail Popkov. As soon as he knew he was a suspect, he got on a train to Vladivostok. We figured if we took a plane, we could be there one day before him. That evening, Victor, two Special Forces policemen and I headed there. We arrived at Vladivostok and contacted the local police. They told us the best place to arrest him. We traveled one stop from the Vladivostok train station. We sat down in different parts of the train car where Popkov was sitting. One of the policemen stayed with me. The other accompanied Victor. We approached him from both sides so that he could not run away. Other people stepped away as we showed our police ID cards. We explained that he was being arrested as a suspect of the murders in Angarsk. He nodded and said, OK, I understand. He didn't refuse to go with us. We found a rifle in his bag. It was a semi-automatic, fully loaded. He could have easily gotten it out and shot the people around him. He knew he was about to be caught, but didn't expect it to happen on the train. The next day, we collected him from the detention center, and he confessed to at least three of the crimes, the crimes in which his DNA had already been compared and matched. He started vacillating. He hoped to get off easy. At first, he didn't deny it, and then it was more like neither yes or no. 
After we explained to him that he had two options, a good one and a bad one for him, he chose the good one. He was allowed to see his relatives. He was allowed to drink alcohol, smoke, have tea, receive parcels. He's a person who loves himself. He's also stingy, greedy. And of course, he accepted our offer. He wrote 10 confession papers. He said he wanted to speak out because he saw the women he murdered in his dreams. Sometimes he woke up at night to check whether his wife and daughter were alive, thinking he might have murdered them. He was confused because reality was mixed up with his memories. In this house, in District 51, Mikhail Popkov lived with his wife and daughter. These are their windows on the second floor. From what their neighbors observed, their family was almost exemplary. They went camping, rode their bikes together. Mikhail was not very talkative, but no one expected him to be a killer. By the way, he worked in the building nearby. Now it's an apartment building, but in the 1990s it was a central police station where Popkov worked as a duty officer. You're you're filming a bunch of rubbish. How long are you going to go on for? Do you know Mikhail Popkov? I do. Do you remember his family? Of course. I know his wife and daughter. They were nice to me. I borrowed money from them sometimes. Everything was okay. Vasily Domaradov came over from Novosibirsk and joined the group. He left a good impression at first. He is intelligent and a real professional. However, for some reason that I couldn't explain, he tried to protect Popkov. He didn't try to prove Popkov was guilty in all the cases. He just focused on the three crimes that we had already proven. He also allowed Popkov's wife and daughter to conduct themselves in a carefree manner during the investigation. For example, in the summer of 2012, no, in the autumn, Popkov's wife was in Domorata's office with Popkov himself and several guards. And she started goofing around on the table lying on the table on her stomach, kicking her feet around, smiling, laughing, behaving inappropriately. One time, I don't remember the reason why, but Popkov's wife went to Irkutsk with us. On the way back, as we approached Angarsk and the Popkov's apartment, Popkov's wife told Demaradov, I'm cooking chicken for dinner tonight. I had no idea who she was talking to. It couldn't be to me or to the driver. She was speaking to Demaradov. I was curious. I left home after my shift. Demaradov said he would stay and work a bit more. I left to do a few errands. I passed by Popkov's apartment, and I saw that the lights were on. I called Popkov's wife. I asked if everything was okay. She said, I'm fine, I'm at work now. Then I asked, who's home then? She hesitated and then said it was her friend that was in. But I could tell that she sounded anxious. I asked again if she was fine and whether she was at work. She said, yes, I'm at work, leave me alone. And then she stopped taking my calls. Zamorata's phone was also off. I received a message only at 2 a.m. The message was that Demaradov had turned his phone on. I gave him a call again. I said I was outside the Popkov's flat and that I knew someone was in there. He replied that he was the person inside. He explained that he had nowhere to live because his travel expenses weren't covered. So he invited himself to Popkov's flat to do his washing. I don't understand how a colonel, 
the head of the investigation group, was staying in the flat of the accused. After this, Demaradov was suspended, wasn't he? Not immediately. First of all, he tried to suspend me. Then he went to see my boss to complain that I was watchdogging him. He claimed he was innocent, he had been intentionally set up, so that he ended up in Popkov's flat. In the end, he was suspended and forced to retire. Popkov's wife now lives with the investigator who used to lead the case. So you're aware that she lives with Domorodov? That's right. You know why Domorodov tried to commute the sentence for Popkov? What was the motive behind it? I know they had met before. No one was aware of it. He introduced the crime map to Popkov and explained which crimes could be fudged. So he showed the map of the crime locations to Popkov, even though a criminal is supposed to draw this map by themselves, right? He showed him the map. He informed Popkov about the evidence that they had and explained what he could and could not say. He was an experienced investigator. I don't know why he acted this way. You told me that they knew each other, so maybe he did it because of friendship. You mean his passion for Popkov's wife? This kind of friendship? Helping him in all kinds of ways, including around the house? Do you remember the first time you met him? I introduced myself, talked about my family, my hometown, my hobbies. I made it clear I was open for a conversation. He was smoking, drinking tea, enjoying my company while I was talking. I personally brought him books and new clothes because I noticed that his clothes were worn out. I literally provided him with clothes and shoes. But I wasn't trying to buy him off. I simply felt sympathetic and I wanted a good working atmosphere. I wanted to talk to someone who was more or less well-dressed. You might think it was a bad idea, but I was trying to be humane. I can't say I was excited to see him, but it was nice to talk to an investigator. That was a relief. But when we spoke earlier, you referred to him as your older brother. He treats me well, in accordance with the law. He talks to me in a respectful way. It is indeed a big deal. If you talk to Popkov without knowing he's a serial killer, that he's committed so many crimes, you might get the impression of an ordinary person. He's fairly well-read and educated. He's literate. He's well-rounded. He has the mindset of a mathematician. He always thinks ahead, planning, calculating. And what if you know he is a serial killer? Then he's disgusting. How can you explain the reason for him to commit these crimes? Is it the pull of some uncontrollable urge or passion? He's been diagnosed as a homicidal maniac. This means he has an irresistible impulse to commit murder. Maybe he neither plans it nor wants it. He just feels that today he needs to kill. He tries to control himself, but this desire accumulates, so things like stress and alcohol cause a breakdown. He has to murder. He can't help it. When he was two or three years old, 
His parents moved to Angarsk and left him in Norilsk, where he was born. He lived there with his grandparents. He was looking forward to seeing his parents. They took him to Angarsk a few years after they had moved and introduced him to his new sister. He saw that she was their favorite child. She got everything while he felt abandoned. He didn't receive enough of his mother's love. So here's the first episode. You know, there are books about serial killers. The authors say people become serial killers after childhood traumas. Could you tell me what happened in your childhood? Perhaps, I don't know. Can you share it? A head injury. I'm talking about something different. I told you the first thing that came into my mind. I was on a Tarzan rope, swinging back and forth, and I had to jump at the right time. But I didn't jump at the right time, and I hit my head. Is that enough for you? Not quite. I understand it does not fit my story, but there is nothing else I have to tell you. Mikhail was an ordinary child that was sent to summer camp. Parents usually come to see their children on weekends, bringing some treats like fruit and sweets, but his parents didn't come for two weekends in a row. He ran away from the camp and went home. He opened the door and saw both of his parents drunk. His mother was having sex with his father's friend. He witnessed the scene. Here's the second episode that provoked hate toward women. That's complete rubbish, to tell you the truth. First of all, in spite of me being a terrible person, trust me, I could not have said that. Just believe me, I, I could not have said that. The third episode happened when he left for the army. He had fallen in love with a woman. He showered her with attention, came to Irkutsk to see her. He gave her flowers and other presents. And then he was conscripted to serve in the army. When he came back, his beloved was already married to someone else and had a child. It had been two years since he left. She said she didn't promise to be with him. So that's the third episode. Maybe she made this up for the investigators. It doesn't sound at all like an objective reason. What did she really tell you? She said she saw me carrying a knife, and she thought badly of me after that. And what do you think was the reason? At that moment, she said we had to break up because I didn't serve in the army. I guess she had another boyfriend who did. She divorced him. I know this for sure. Here is one of the latest episodes. His sister moved to Sakhalin as she grew up. He received a message that she had become a dissolute person, degraded, drinking, seeing different men. He went to Sakhalin and took her back here. A lot of emotions accumulated from all of these episodes. Come on, stop. I asked you to refrain from this far-fetched thinking. His wife took part in the latest episode. He came home for lunch during his shift. It happened in March. He saw his five-year-old daughter playing outdoors late in the evening. The weather was chilly and she wasn't wearing enough clothes. She was freezing. He asked her why she was outside. And she said, Someone came to see her mother, so she was sent out for a walk. He rushed in with his daughter. He saw his wife happy and relaxed. He found two beer bottles and a used condom in a rubbish bin. His wife confessed to cheating on him. That was the last straw. These episodes built up over time and gradually turned a nice boy named Misha into the most notorious killer in Russia's modern history. Why didn't you get a divorce? 
Вот видимо, скажем так. I didn't consider that. И посчитал это. Divorce. Единственно правильно. Was the only right way to solve this problem. Tens of millions of people in this country live like this. They live with our living standards. Millions and millions. I'm just one out of these millions. If he was released right now, I would go back to him. Do you love him? Yes, I do. I support him. He's never abused me. Have you met his wife and daughter? Yes, during the investigation process. What did you think of them? Were they open to you? They seemed absent-minded. They wanted the investigation to be over. They wanted to move to another town and go on with their lives. I saw no remorse, no regret in their eyes. Unfortunately, both of them were busy with their own lives. They didn't come to see Popkov in the prison. When they offered him the chance to call his family, he only wanted to talk to his daughter. He didn't want to talk to his wife. Do they send you letters? Yes, they do. What do they say? They say they're fine. How often? Let's not talk about my family. We both understand that he was not interested in his wife. His wife was not interested in him either. Both of them simply used each other. He wanted his daughter to grow up in a two-parent family. He saw his wife cheating on him a few times. After the arrest of Popkov, I saw what she was really like. When I had just met her for the first interrogation, she was dressed in clothes with a low neckline, demonstrating her breasts to me, looking in my eyes. I asked her to cover up in order to begin the interrogation. She followed my advice. She calmed down and covered up. I told Popkov about it. I explained that I didn't like it. I asked him to explain to her that this is not acceptable for me. He was ashamed. He looked down and promised to talk to her about it. Do you remember what preceded the first murder you committed? What led up to it that day? You mean... What made you feel irritated? It was spontaneous. It was just an argument of some kind. It led to a big conflict and I accidentally hit her with a wine bottle. When you realized that the woman was dead, how did that make you feel? I was afraid. What else could I feel? And what kind of fear? I was afraid they'd be looking for me and that I would be held responsible for the crime. He's like a bear who has tried human flesh. Once he tries it, then he can't stop. The first murder, the second, the third, the tenth, the twentieth, the fiftieth, one after the other. And this sensation of the need to kill, the need to kill another person, was the result of an emotional outburst, or stress, or an argument. The first journalist who came to report on the story gave him a nickname, the cleaner. In his opinion, if a woman wanted to go home to see her family, instead of going out with him, despite his persuasion, he took her home because she was a good woman. He believed that she had a right to live. 
Эта женщина согласна. А тем более потом вступать в половую связь. Для него это же. Он сам уже падшая, да? Он этих убил. Смертный приговор. Но не было такого. But he wasn't looking for fallen women on purpose. When a woman got into his car, he made a determination for himself who she was, and he decided whether to commit a crime. But he wasn't looking for them specifically. As far as I understand, many of the women he gave rides to, he left unharmed. A lot of women don't try to understand your position, but try to put themselves in the position of your victims. And they wonder, why did your victims deserve to be murdered? What was it about them that made you act the way you did? And also, I wonder how one person can decide whether another person should be allowed to live or not. Wait, this is not a question to ask me. These women you're talking about have started to reconsider their behavior. Maybe this can stop them from immoral behavior. Maybe this will help them control their desires and instincts to a certain extent. So you think that women who don't control their desires and are free to do whatever they want, these women don't deserve to live? Hold on. They partied, they had alcohol, and they wanted even more. They wanted to get drunk. They wanted the party to go on. I'm not making excuses for myself. I'm trying to answer your question. What have they done to be murdered? They partied, and then they wanted more. Well, it was bad luck for them to meet me. The women who hooked up with him said he was loved by females. Мужчина был подтянутый. He was good looking, tidy, athletically built, polite, courteous. Женщина, у которой мужик был с таким бузом, с похмелья. And for women who were married to men with pot bellies, constantly drunk, not caring about their wives, Popkov looked like a good candidate. Пусть она будет там семиминутно, но ей мужчина симпатичный. Women want to be loved, looked after, even if it's only for a short period of time. Убийство он получал энергии. Popkov gave them what they wanted. Every murder gave him energy. If we neglect all the evidence and testimony, I think taking someone's life gave him energy. He was satisfied, even sexually satisfied, with every death. He needed more and more of it. It helped him carry on. People risk their lives every day. You risk it when you go out, even without knowing it. You don't know what can happen and whether you'll go back home. Anything could happen. Look at young people now. Well, we did the same thing at their age. We like to go out, party, travel somewhere. In the morning, we would wake up and regret it. That's life, and no one has the right to kill based on their beliefs.
Но при этом... He hasn't shown the least bit of remorse for his actions. You're absolutely right. I talked to him up to 2018. Not once has he said that he regretted killing people. He regrets that he was caught and sent to prison. But killing so many people, destroying so many families, ruining so many lives, doesn't bother him at all. It was published in Life News, I think, that Popkov wanted to commit suicide in prison. Do you think that's true? That's rubbish. He loves and values life. He might live longer than we do. He will survive. He adapts easily to new circumstances. He's like a cockroach. He's just as resilient. For someone his age, he's still in great shape. He's 56 years old. He feels great. He's completely healthy. His cellmates and the prison staff say he likes to work out. He can do 50 pull-ups at a time. Seriously? Yeah. He's over 50. He's been isolated from society for a long period of time. He doesn't get enough protein. He has to eat whatever food he's offered. He's also a smoker. Do you think you're a normal person? You want my opinion? Sure. I guess I'm not. Medical examiners say I'm abnormal, I'm abnormal. And then they ask whether I am competent to assess my actions. The answer is yes. However, according to the laws of our society, what I did was not normal. That's what I mean. So you understand me. I see. Do you think you're a good man? Well, you want me to say I'm not normal, but good. You put me in an awkward position. I always tried to become a reasonable and good person. But here I am. You know, I talked to the relatives of some of the victims. All of them regret that there's no death penalty in this country. But why? They don't get it. Maybe I would have appreciated having the death penalty too. I could have been executed in 2015, in May. His appearance is very telling of his background. Based on his appearance, he could have killed twice as many people. He's got the eyes of a killer. His look is completely empty. He looks like it's easy for him to kill. It's so obvious. He's terrifying. He looks like Andrei Chikatilo. He was silent, with his head down. He had nothing to say. What can I say to him? He's in prison now. If he was standing here right now, it would be a different thing. When I was approached by the head department, they asked to provide a list of people to be rewarded. Some of the people on the list were my subordinates. I suggested giving each one of them a state award. There were not too many of them, maybe seven or eight people. They told me this award can't be given to so many people. I asked why. They told me only one person can receive a state award. 
The others could receive merit certificates, wage bonuses. Also, they gave them local department awards, which mean nothing. They presented me with a state award and a medal for maintaining public order, and they paid me a bonus of seven monthly salaries. Maslakov and Pavlov received local department medals for excellent service and certificates signed by the Minister of Internal Affairs. That's it. Others received a 5,000 ruble wage bonus. That's it. Our investigation group had existed since 2012. We had never been given bonuses. Sometimes they give cars or other expensive gifts to mark Criminal Investigators Day. In our case, we received nothing. The rating system is still present in our police. Their colleagues thought that they were not meeting the goals. They were jealous because the investigation group had enough freedom to travel for work. They used all possible means to catch criminals. Why did you decide to retire? I was irritated. Those who do nothing but gossip and report on others, they're easily promoted. In contrast, we, the exemplary team that solved this difficult case, we were just sent off. And that's why I decided to retire. This is how we lose people who can work and want to work. They could be invited to teach in police schools. They could have passed on their experience. They could explain how to perform their duties. The example of a hero is inspiring for young people. Young people are looking for heroes. They can be both positive and negative characters. Do you regret all those years that you spent looking for the killer? No, I don't regret it. I wasn't only working on this case. As a policeman, I worked hard and I earned every salary that I was paid by the taxpayers. And my job involved ridding the world of a huge number of criminals and villains. The worst of them was Popkov. Many people have been, are, and will be in my place. I'm not the first and not the last to be here. The Irkutsk Regional Court sentenced Popkov to life in prison twice, in 2015 and 2018.